1. Let me just start out by saying that before I worked at this movie theatre, I didn't really believe in ghosts or anything of the sort. I've always been good at rationalizing things and thinking of logical explanations for any weird events that happened growing up. So when I first started at the theatre a little over six years ago, I laughed off any ghost stories that my co-workers told me about the place. That is, until I had some experiences of my own. Something that several employees have claimed to see is a shadow person. In some cases, more than one, but it's usually just one that I hear about. And it's always near the end of the hallway to the south of our concession stand. People have also reported seeing it in the same end of the building, but on the upper floor in projection. Always hanging out in or between theatres 5 and 6. Multiple employees have also claimed to see what they described as sort of a glowing silhouette of a person, which they usually would just catch a glimpse of before it disappeared. And has been seen in multiple places. One girl once told me that supposedly, a woman came to see a movie maybe like seven or so years ago, and the woman randomly walked up to this employee and said that she can see auras and spirits and whatnot, and told her that she just wanted to let us know that we had a sweet little spirit wandering around the lobby. Something you should know is that a year or so before I started, I'm not sure of the exact date, there was a murder-suicide in the parking lot of the theatre involving a man and his little girl. I'm not positive what the circumstances were, but the rumour was that he was in the middle of a custody battle with her mother, so he took her to one last outing to see a movie, and then shot her and himself in his car afterward. The employee that found them got a couple paid weeks off and needed therapy for some time. She doesn't work there anymore. Another thing is that apparently one of the past employees stumbled upon what appeared to have been the remnants of some sort of sacrificial ritual behind the building by the trash compactor. If I remember right, there was a raccoon head or something like that back there, with stones circled around it. Not quite sure what that's all about. My personal experiences include seeing that shadow person down the end of the hallway, both upstairs and downstairs. I've caught a glimpse of something blue, white and glowing out of the corner of my eye. When I was in a dark theatre by myself, cleaning with the lights off. I shouldn't have been, but it was a slow day. I'm a manager now, so if I open, I'll be there by myself in the morning for about half an hour before employees start showing up. And I almost always hear footsteps, unmistakable steps, complete with the sound of thighs and pants rubbing together and everything. Walking down the hall and into the office, and they stop at the desk. I used to get up if I heard it with my back turned, to look to see if someone showed up early, but I'm used to it happening now. I always get inexplicably scared or uneasy. In both theatres 5 and 6, also in projection, between both projectors, they're next to each other. Even before I knew about or believed in the ghost stories. My most jarring experience was one of my first. I was cleaning theatres and I go to Theatre 6, which was supposed to be empty. Sometimes people sneak into theatres on slower days, so I went to make sure nobody was in there before moving on. I walked up the ramp and looked over the side of the railing and saw a lone person sitting in the middle of the row, behind handicap seating. I remember seeing facial features and everything. It looked like a middle-aged man. It looked kinda like he was glowing but the screen was also illuminating him. I was a little annoyed since the theatre was supposed to be empty, but I figured he had already made it through the whole movie as credits were about to start, and I didn't see much point in confronting him. I went back to the entrance of the auditorium and waited for him to come out, so if I could see if he'd made a mess around his seat. There are only two exits from the auditorium. The one I was standing by and the one to the side of the screen at the end of the ramp, leading into the auditorium, which I had a clear view of. Credits rolled, finished, and the lights came up. After standing for a few minutes waiting for the guy to come out, I got irritated and went in to tell him to leave so I could clean. But he wasn't there anymore. If there had actually been a person in there, I would have definitely seen them leave. Another one that really showed me that this isn't all in my head 
is one time a couple came out of Theatre 15 and went to the bathroom afterward, etc., and started walking toward me in concession. The girl walked up to me and immediately said, Is this theatre haunted? I was taken by surprise and asked why, and they told me that they had the auditorium to themselves, only two tickets had been sold to it. And apparently during their whole movie, they both kept thinking that they were hearing footsteps as if someone was running back and forth in the row behind them, with the occasional whispering. After the movie, the girl went to use the restroom, which she also had to herself. And while she was sitting down doing her business, she thought she heard footsteps walk in the bathroom, walk to the farthest stall from the entrance, and then that toilet flushed. When the girl was done, she left her stall and nobody else was in there with her. And her boyfriend said that he didn't see anyone go in either. One of the weirdest parts though, Theatre 15 just so happens to be the theatre that the aforementioned man and little girl had seen their last movie in. I believe the movie was Rio. I could go on about the stories I've heard about this place, as well as give a few more of my own. But this is already a novella, and I'm sure you get the picture. 2. First off, I do not believe in ghosts. I believe that there are demons, and demons can take on many forms. I am also a Christian, non-denominational. The Bible says that even Satan can transform into an angel of light. Therefore, if there are literally billions upon billions of demons all around us since we were born, it is not hard to deduce that they would know everything about a person. That would be the reason why Joe Blow Psychic knows what your favorite aunt used to call you, or what your dead mother used to sing to you at night when you were a child. With that said, I digress. Let me share my experience with so-called hauntings. When I was a young boy growing up in the 80s, I lived in this really creepy old farmhouse that was built sometime in the late 1800s to early 1900s. The house at the time was on the edge of an urban sprawl that has since been torn down and made into high-density urban neighborhoods. The house used to be an old single-story ranch-style home for the farm it used to sit on. In this house was a hidden door in the floor right in front of the bathroom that was covered by carpet and had a round eyelet you could pull up to open. The previous owners slash tenants were taxidermists. You would open this secret basement hatch, and there was a ladder to a small basement of sorts, where the taxidermist would do his work. It was super creepy down there. There were still jars of formaldehyde with organs and body parts of various animals. Also, there was some taxidermist equipment left down there as well. As a boy, I was always too frightened to go down there. It was very ominous, to say the least. There was also evidence that someone practiced witchcraft or Satanism in that house at one time. That house always gave me the creeps. Now on to a couple of stories. One night I was lying in bed, and I was awoken to a steady tapping on my window. It was a steady and quiet tap tap tap, about three taps per second. I remember being scared out of my wits. I looked in the direction of my window and saw a strange orange glow outside my window. I was about to scream from my parents when all of a sudden, a little boy jumps up from under my bed and smiles his evil demonic smile at me. The scariest part about it was, the little boy looked exactly like me. At that point I lost it and screamed. The specter of the boy vanished and my mother came running into my room. My dad went outside to check by the window and there was nothing. Super creepy. Another time I fell asleep on my couch. It was night time, so my mom, not wanting to wake me, just covered me with blankets and let me sleep there, instead of waking me to move me to my bedroom. I remember waking up in the middle of the night. For some reason I don't recall, but there was some visibility throughout my house, even though it was night. Perhaps the moon or street lights, I don't remember. Anyway, there was just enough light to see across the living room and into my bathroom that had the door open and was right next to the hatch I mentioned earlier. On the toilet sat this demonic-looking chimpanzee. It looked slowly towards me and smiled this horrifying smile. To top it off, its eyes were glowing red. I screamed at the top of my lungs. Needless to say, I slept with my parents that night. Other things that used to happen. I would see tons of shadow people, some tall, some small like imps, 
cupboard doors would open and close all by themselves. I would sometimes hear my mother calling my name from another room, only to realize she was not at home. Horrible nightmares. I recall sleeping almost every night under my covers, with just a hole for my nose. 3. Back in high school, my best friend moved into her grandma's house. She was so terrified to stay there alone that she was constantly begging me to sleep over. There was just something about the house that made you uncomfortable to the point of tears. It always felt like something was standing behind you. I experienced a couple of things like the sink turning on by itself while my friend and I were alone, and things falling off the kitchen counters, but never anything that sent me running home. Eventually I got used to being in the house and started to feel more comfortable there, until one night when me, my friend and her mom all fell asleep in the living room. In the living room there is a door that goes into my friend's grandpa's bedroom. He was at work that night, but we made sure to leave the door shut before we fell asleep, because we didn't want the dog going in there. In the middle of the night her mom got up to go to the bathroom and realized the door to said bedroom was open. As she walked back into the living room, the light in the bedroom came on. She thought one of us went in there to use the master bathroom and called out, who's in there, to see which one of us was awake. Nobody answered. The light went out. She called out my friend's name. The light came back on. Off. On. Off. On. I woke up to her yelling our names and panicking. Sure enough, the door was cracked open, and the master bedroom light was on. I've never seen her scared in my life. She loves the paranormal. Always talking about ghosts, watching ghost shows, obsessed with aliens and all that good stuff. And never in the eleven years I'd known her had I seen such a horrified look on her face. The scariest part of this for me was the next day, when I told my friend's grandma everything that happened while she was asleep at the other end of the house. She told me that at night, she feels something walk into her room and pat on her bed. She then hears footsteps in the hall all the time, and has seen a girl multiple times. I had just started to feel comfortable in the house, and now I find myself running out of every room I end up alone in. 4. Yesterday afternoon, my friend texted me about a scary experience she had the night before. She went to meditate when suddenly, for the first time ever, she felt an unfriendly energy shaking her. She went to verbally call out for help from angels and guides, and found not only she couldn't remember the names of any of her protectors that she knows and calls too often, she also couldn't speak. She tried to, but she couldn't control her mouth or voice enough to even form any words. It only lasted about five to six seconds, and she tried to just shake it off and go to sleep after. But then she noticed she was having very intrusive and disturbing thoughts. She got up and smudged everything, and was finally able to get some peace and go to sleep. She texted me the next day and asked if I could get a read on the energy that attacked her. My wife and I invited her over to dinner to make sure she was doing okay and to talk about it. After dinner, we all came up with the bright idea of meditating together to see what we might individually feel about her experience and energy, to compare notes after. Now, when I go to do any distance work, including all my exorcisms to date, I have a whole ritual I run through before I even start that is designed to make sure I'm balanced, connected, and protected. However, when meditating in person with friends, my tendency is to connect with all the people in the room first, so I can help balance their energy too. So we all sit quietly, close our eyes. I go to connect with my wife and friend, and immediately I feel an energy come off my friend and go into me. Surprise! I can't say it felt dark, but it did feel very heavy and stifling. I tried to go into my distance routine of calling on my team, and smiled when I couldn't remember any of their names. I knew I knew them, but my mind was somehow being held from saying them. I switched quickly to plan B and visualized all divine beings surrounding this entity with light, love, and even laughter, embracing it and inviting it to see the light and to move onward in mercy. It felt a lot like a surprise party 
where you could be having the worst day. But then you are met with an overwhelming and sudden outpouring of love, friendship, and well wishes. Had the spirit refused this outpouring, I would have been surprised again. It opened to it, and enjoyed it for about three minutes before moving onward. Beautiful ending for the most part. After we all compared notes, my friend who remembered to protect herself before beginning had a wonderful experience where she immediately felt lighter, wonder why, and then felt uplifted. My wife who didn't remember to do any special protections, even though I reminded them right before, I didn't listen either, found herself going back and forth in her mind between peace and darkness, where she finally got exhausted and curled up into a ball. We were all able to balance out and recover after it was over, and then laughed about what a bunch of amateurs we were. No harm, no foul, good lessons learned. 5. Though this happened close to eight or nine years ago, I still remember it like it was yesterday. The experience was nothing short of jarring, even as someone that had become rather used to the random episodes of sleep paralysis. I have, quite honestly, had sleep paralysis episodes for the majority of my life. In fact, the earliest one I can remember is from when I was five years old. This particular experience, however, happened when I was almost 20. My husband and I had this little apartment, nothing to brag about really, just outside of our city's downtown area. We had lived in it for the better part of two years, though the walls were still mostly bare, and the fact that we held an understandable aversion to the scent of cat piss that filtered down from our upstairs neighbor's place. It was still home. During this time, my husband held a normal job at a local shopping center, eight hours a day for decent pay. I too kept a steady place of work at a local sex store, and though the pay was, quite honestly, shit, I enjoyed what I did. Our schedules, however, had us working opposite times every now and then, so there were certain days that I had the apartment to myself. On this particular day, I was alone in the apartment. I wasn't really doing anything unusual, in fact, I had spent most of the day leveling up in the new MMORPG my husband and I had picked up a few weeks prior. It's something that he and I do together on a regular basis. Both of us enjoy video games and we make a great team in them. I don't really remember falling asleep on the couch, but apparently I did. I woke up laying on the couch with my head on a pillow and my body in a straight line. Voices surrounded me, whispering so softly that I honestly was unable to make out anything they said in the beginning. I couldn't move, a fact that after realizing it, sent me into an inner panic. Stuck there, I shifted my gaze downward on the couch and I saw what, at first glance, was simply a shadow figure. But it changed into the figure of my husband. I remember thinking just how strange it was that he would be there at that time, and wondering if something had happened that made him get sent home early from his shift. I also recall being put off a bit by his posture, the way he was sitting at the foot of the couch was nothing like his normal posture. It was too uptight. This thing that so closely resembled my husband leered at me sideways from beneath his hat. It leaned over my body, close to my face, so close that I could smell its breath. Breath that reeked of rot, decay, death. And I, paralyzed, could do little more than stare, livid as it chuckled. You mean nothing to me, came its first sentence, and watching it fall from those lips, lips I had kissed every day for years, I felt a pang of hurt. Though I somewhere deep down knew that whatever it was in front of me couldn't possibly be my husband. I still couldn't stop that pain from bubbling up from within. You're worthless, scum. You always have been and you know it. How could I love you in any way? Laying there, my heart beating rapid palpitations against my ribs, I felt the tears well up. I didn't want to cry, didn't want to give this thing the satisfaction of seeing me cry. Then the other voices that had been mere whispers in the beginning started repeating the imposter. Worthless, worthless, worthless. Scum, always scum. They were getting louder by the minute, and I had no idea how to stop them. 
and I couldn't even tell where they were coming from. You worthless bitch. You should have stayed in your hometown. You'll never amount to anything more than a worthless little whore. Hell, you're barely even deserving of being the dirt on my fucking shoe. I couldn't break eye contact from it. I let myself stare it down. And I stared so long at this thing that I began to notice subtle differences between it and my husband. Little things that most people wouldn't even see. Like the fact that this thing lacked the thin scar in its left eyebrow that my husband had from a ripped out piercing. The thin scar that I had spent countless hours tracing with my index finger and thumb while we cuddled in bed. And the fact that his eyes were not blue with golden flecks around the iris and pupil that I had become so accustomed to waking up to each morning. I noticed that, even though it had the same voice my husband had, it lacked the conviction of its words that my husband would have carried, had he been saying and meaning those things. And on top of all of that, I realized that this thing simply could not be my husband, because my husband was at work at the time. It was nearly two in the afternoon, and my husband was working until five. Though I still couldn't move my limbs, I narrowed my eyes at this entity. Staring it dead on, I thought toward it, you are not my husband. You might have his general form, but you are not him. You need to leave. You are not, in any way, welcome in my home. I repeated this in my mind over and over again, until the imposter disappeared and the other voices faded away. I repeated it until I regained control of my body, until I was able to sit upright on the couch. I was so deeply shaken by the entire experience that I had to call a friend to come to my apartment to hang out with me until my husband got off work that day. I had never experienced something like that before, even though I had been through multiple sleep paralysis episodes in the past. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 86. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Well, it won't be long till I'm at 100 of these videos. Should probably do something. No idea what I'm going to do, though, but I should probably do something to mark the, the anniversary. Ah, well, we're heading into the weekend now, so I hope you guys all have a good one. And with that, I'm going to head off for now, as I need to relax and put food in my body and things. Very, very important. Okay, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.